adversity. I've been a dietitian since 2016. Um, I did my undergrad at University of New Hampshire um, and did my dietetic internship at UMass Amherst in 2016. I became a dietitian in 2017 um, or in 2016 and have been with SNU at Sodexo um, since 2017. I also have worked as a clinical dietitian, as a personal trainer, as a high school field hockey coach, um, lots of fun things. I also specialize in um, sports nutrition as a board certified sports dietitian, and I have um, I work in private practice part time specializing in sports nutrition, eating disorders and disordered eating. Okay, so today, like I said, we are going to talk all about how the brain and the gut connect and interact. So we'll start by introducing the gut brain access. Um, from there, we'll talk all about how the brain and the gut communicate. We'll go through some food choices that can support a healthy gut and brain, some meal ideas, and go over some healthy habits. So I'm sure many of you have either heard these sayings, experienced some of these thoughts before. My stomach is tied up in knots. I have a gut feeling. I have butterflies in my stomach. We know that our thoughts can 100% physically manifest in our gut. I know personally, I have this like vivid experience from high school when I did cross country skiing. And it was always a really nerve wracking experience when races came. Um, all of our teams, all of the athletes got super nervous. There was just this added pressure for whatever reason in this sport. And there were a lot of bathroom stops. There was lots of time spent in the bathroom before the event. Lots of people were not feeling great, having an upset stomach. And this was not relating to the food they were eating. It was really related to the anxiety and the stress that was causing their gut to feel a little queasy. So I'm sure um, some of you have had experiences like this where either you're excited or something crazy is going on or you're nervous and you have felt that deep in your stomach. And we'll talk about why that is. So we have something called the gut-brain access, and this is a two-way communication between the central nervous system and the enteric nervous system. The ENS covers the entire GI tract, um, and this access links the emotional and cognitive centers of the brain with intestinal functions. So within this connection of the gut and the brain, we also want to consider our microbiome, which is basically all of the colonies, all of the bacteria um, that live in our intestine from our mouth all the way down to our colon. Our GI tract runs that whole way and there is tons and tons, there are trillions of bacteria that live there. So these bacteria, the microbiota in the intestine interact with intestinal cells, that enteric nervous system, and with the neural, endocrine, immune, and metabolic pathways within our central nervous system. So these bacteria play a lot of parts in our health and interact with many systems in the human body. And like I said, and the focus on this presentation is really going to be looking at how it interacts with the brain. So oh, how this interaction really takes place is through the vagus nerve. And the vagal nerves are the main nerves of your parasympathetic nervous system. And this system controls the specific body functions, um, such as your digestion, your heart rate, and your immune system. These functions are all involuntary, meaning that you can't consciously control them. Essentially, what can happen is that the gut microbes um, can activate the vagus nerve, and this alerts the brain of inflammatory cytokines, and this chronic activation can lead to feelings of anxiety, depression, or panic disorders. Um, so really recognizing that these bacteria can cause positive or negative influences. Um, so really some pretty interesting connections here. Now, we don't know which came first, right? The chicken or the egg? Is it the brain that's causing GI stuff or is it GI stuff that's then linking back to the brain? Research really is out on that. And um, we think that there's probably a mix of both. Um, specifically, it's really interesting that 40% of people with IBS also suffer with anxiety. Um, I'm sure if anybody on this call has anxiety, they might know that, hey, when you're feeling really anxious, your IBS flares up. Or if you have IBS, that can make you really anxious thinking about, am I going to need to use a bathroom? Can I go to the situation? Making it a little um, more nervous about that kind of stuff. 
So really unsure of which comes first. Another important consideration is that 90 to 95% of serotonin, which is our mood stabilizing neurotransmitter, is produced in the gut. So this neurotransmitter um, helps regulate sleep, appetite, mediates moods, and inhibits pain. So really important, if we're not producing enough serotonin, how is that then influencing the brain and our mental health? So let's dive in to food for good mood with specifically focusing on how to build and populate a good gut microbiome. So if anybody is familiar with gut health, um, I'm sure many of you have heard of prebiotics and probiotics. Probiotics specifically, I feel like have been getting a little spotlight over the past five to 10 years. They are everywhere. I feel like probiotics are in so many foods now. They're in supplements. They're like, they're everywhere. The health and wellness industry is really hopped on board here. Um, but what are probiotics? They are the good bacteria that populate in your gut microbiome. So essentially, they're the active live cultures that can help change or repopulate intestinal bacteria to balance out your gut flora. So they're the good guys. They are the good bugs that live in your GI system that really help colonate and support um, regular digestion, your immune system, your mental health, all of these things. These are the good guys. We also have prebiotics, and these are non-digestible food components that promote the flourishment of good gut bacteria which basically means that these are the food for probiotics. Prebiotics are foods that we eat that then um, our probiotic gut um, bugs can then munch on and grow more and repopulate and produce really good colonies. And prebiotics are essentially fiber, which we'll touch on in a moment. So let's first start with probiotics and some food sources of these. So probiotics, um, I'm really focusing today, um, as you can imagine, on food. As a dietitian, I use a food first approach. I really like to try and utilize foods before supplements. Um, I'm sure many of you know there are hundreds of probiotic supplements out there right now. Not a ton of research on the general use of probiotic supplements. Um, they likely will not do harm, but I personally don't think they're necessary if you are choosing foods that are going to help your body produce their own probiotics. There are some conditions, especially um, inflammatory bowel diseases, that there is some solid research on specific probiotics and specific strains of bacteria that can be helpful. But for today's purpose on mental health um, and brain health, there really aren't any probiotics that I think um, supplement wise that are necessary to use and that you should choose for foods first. So foods that have these um, live active cultures are typically created through the fermentation process. So the most common foods I'd say would be yogurt. Um, yogurt and kefir are both very popular forms of dairy. Um, both are fermented. Kefir is fermented, or fermented milk. Um, it's more of like a drinkable yogurt, very tart yogurt. You can see if you look on the back of many yogurt labels, you'll see on there live active cultures. Lactobacillus is a big one um, that you'll see on the actual label. So check that out. If you're looking at yogurt or kefir, look to see if there are um, bacteria colonies on there that are actually present and it will say live active cultures. Other forms of probiotics are going to be kimchi. Um, this is fermented cabbage. There are also tons of other fermented vegetables now. Um, if you go into any like Whole Foods or honestly like any grocery store now, there's fermented carrots and there's fermented beets and there's fermented so many different types of fermented um, vegetables that you can add in as condiments. There's sauerkraut. Um, there's tempeh and miso, which are fermented soy products. So tempeh is fermented soybeans. Um, within this photo, it's the bottom right. And this is a great vegan meat replacement. Um, I love tempeh compared to tofu. There is a much firmer texture. Um, I think it has more of a nutty taste. So I replace it a lot as like a ground turkey alternative. You can crumble it up and it looks pretty similar. You can also just slice it or dice it um, and pan fry it, grill it. I think it's really fantastic. Miso is a paste, more of a condiment from soybeans. Um, and then there's also kombucha, which is fermented tea and sourdough bread, which is the fermented bread yeast. So lots of different food sources that add probiotics in. I don't think you have to have probiotics at every single meal or necessarily every single day to add these in and to reap the benefits. Building up, having them a couple times a week, if you enjoy, if you like having yogurt daily and you notice 
that, hey, this helps keep me regular, this helps makes me feel good, then incorporate those types of things, but know that you can kind of mix it up. Next, we have prebiotics. So again, prebiotics are very rich in fiber, and fiber is a type of non-digestible carbohydrate that does not get broken down in our stomach and small intestine like most other foods do. Most foods are broken down and absorbed in the small intestine, whereas fiber passes all the way through until the large intestine. And that's where all of your probiotic um, gut bugs live, and they munch on that fiber and use that for fuel. So fiber-rich foods um, are really going to be your plant foods. So whole grain products, things like whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, um, any sort of other whole grains like farro, barley, millet, quinoa, brown rice, teff. There are so many out there. Um, if you go just in the rice aisle of your grocery store, you will see a ton. There's also beans and lentils, nuts and seeds, fruits and vegetables, any and all. There is no one that's better than the other. I know there are lists of prebiotic um, foods out there like bananas and artichokes and celery. And sure, some of these might have different types of fibers in them. All of these foods provide fiber. And the more variety you're getting in plant foods, the different types of fibers you'll be introducing to your gut to populate different types of probiotics. So variety is really the king here. Let's go through some meal ideas. So for breakfast, these are just a couple of ideas that can incorporate prebiotics and maybe probiotics. Not all of these will have probiotics in them. But one would be using old fashioned rolled oats with rice cauliflower. This is a trick that I personally love to add vegetables in if you're trying to sneak them in a little bit more. Um, I will add frozen rice cauliflower into my oats like halfway through the cooking process. So a one to one ratio, if you're doing a half cup of oats, you do a half cup of rice cauliflower, throw it in halfway in the microwave, and then it will cook right in has the same texture, doesn't have any tastes, you have no idea it's there. And it's an easy way to sneak in some veggies if you want to, you do not have to. But then adding in chia seeds, peanut butter, a banana to get some more variety there. Greek yogurt for some probiotics with musili, um, berries and ground flaxseed. A smoothie that's made with kefir as the liquid um, with mixed berries, some greens and almond butter. Or you could do avocado toast using sourdough bread with hemp seeds and fried eggs. So there's some breakfast ideas and then some lunch and dinner ideas could be a whole wheat wrap with falafel, which is made from chickpeas, hummus, um, spinach, tomatoes and peppers. You could do a burrito bowl made with brown rice, um, beans, lent uh, lettuce, tomatoes, salsa, guacamole, a summer salad with farro, strawberries, arugula, goat cheese, sunflower seeds, chicken. Um, you can add in, I have a balsamic dressing here, but you could also use an apple cider vinegar dressing that has some natural probiotics in it as well, if you enjoy that. Um, a grain bowl with quinoa, roasted veggies, um, roasted beans, and tahini dressing. Tempeh stir fry with frozen stir fry vegetables, brown rice noodles, and peanut soy sauce. Kimchi fried brown rice with mushrooms, um, green onion, sunny side up eggs and whole wheat non-pizza with pesto, mozzarella, spinach, and tomatoes. Now you'll see most of these foods are uh, vegetarian or vegan, and you do not have to be vegetarian or vegan in order to reap the benefits of eating more plants. I personally am not. Um, I eat meat most days and still find that you can incorporate many fruits and vegetables and incorporate plant-based foods a lot of the time. You do not have to have any labels on your eating or be restrictive in order to reap the benefits of just adding in more whole grains, more beans, more lentils, more fruits and veggies. Additional snack ideas. Um, when I'm creating a snack, there are a couple of things I want to consider. So first, is there a source of carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are your body's source of energy, and incorporating a snack is a way to add in more energy, give you food when you're hungry, nourish your brain, so we want to get carbs. So if that's coming from fruit, if it's coming from whole grains, if it's coming from starches, um, vegetables, personally, I don't think have enough carbohydrates to really count, but definitely add them in for some extra nutrition. So some ideas that incorporate fiber and whole grains would be apple with peanut butter, whole wheat crackers with cheese and veggies, um, veggies and pita bread or pita chips with hummus, a nut and seed bar like a kind bar or a Lara bar, plant-based protein bars. My favorites are Go Macro and Perfect Bars. Um, homemade energy bites and trail mix are some ideas.
So some additional ways to increase fiber. So like I mentioned before, eat more plants. So it doesn't mean you have to restrict anything. I'm a big adding instead of subtracting person. Um, so if you can aim to increase, if you only eat one fruit or vegetable a day, aim for two. If you eat two, aim for three. You don't need to eat like 10 or 11, but trying for things like five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And this can be easily snuck into so many different types of um, meals. Choosing whole grains most of the time when you can. Eating beans and lentils three to four times a week. Again, building up to this. I'm sure many of you know the cute little jingle, beans, beans, the magical fruit. Um, if you're not used to eating beans, they will potentially cause some GI distress. Eating a lot of fiber if you're not used to it can increase bloating, can increase um, just distension, gassiness. That is very normal. Your body takes more work to break down fiber. So ease into it if you're not used to it. Um, and I think I've stressed this enough already, but increase the variety of the types of foods you're eating. So if you buy spinach every single week, maybe the next week buy kale, maybe buy Swiss chard. If you always just buy bananas and apples, maybe get some um, other types of berries, maybe get oranges, maybe get papaya. When in doubt, buy things that are in season and on sale. That will help force you to mix up the variety. Okay. Um, also just touching on the gut microbiome, um, as I've said already, the gut influences so many different aspects of the human body way more than just our brain. So yes, it's our second brain. It has a lot going on in there. Um, but it also houses 70% of the immune system. This is super important with the pandemic, with COVID still being quite high in the Northeast where I am located. Um, so really feeding your gut, um, really strong and healthy foods can support your immune system as well. Um, and like we've said, these 100 trillion bacteria live in your gut. I hope it doesn't freak anyone out. You don't know they're there. They're just there for you. Um, we're all just a nice big clump of bugs when it comes down to it. But regardless, really, really remembering that these foods that you eat can play a role. But they do not play the only role. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So some additional ways to support your gut health would be to get adequate sleep. Sleep, in my opinion, is the most important thing on health. Um, as a dietitian, I think that says a lot. I think sleep is more important than what you eat. Um, getting adequate sleep really helps your body do all of its repair work. We have a lot of stress throughout the day coming in many different avenues. And sleeping lets your body get that really, really good, deep healing, restorative time. Um, make sure you're drinking plenty of water, especially if you're not used to having fiber-rich foods really helps um, with that digestion. So I typically recommend taking your body weight and dividing it in half, and that's how many ounces of water minimum you should be drinking. So for reference, um, for ease of mass, if you weigh 200 pounds, aiming for around 100 ounces a day, build up to this. If you are not used to drinking a lot of water, build up. Um, always listen to your body. I don't want anybody feeling like they're waterboarding themselves. Um, you shouldn't have to pee every 15 minutes, but really starting to build up your water, especially as it gets hotter outside. Use a squatty potty when you poop. Um, it is really important to get into the correct anatomical position when you are passing a bowel movement. This will help make sure that you're getting everything cleaned out. You are helping um, just move things through better. And that is really, really great having regular consistent bowel movements for your gut health. Make sure to practice mindful eating. If you are eating in a stressed out way, so let's say you're rushing through your meals, you're not paying attention, you're not chewing your food very well, all of these things can play a role into how your body digests. Try and get yourself into a peaceful environment where you're paying attention to your eating so your body can truly get into the parasympathetic state where it can do solid digestion. This will help the gut feel better um, and digest easier. Daily movement is another really important aspect of good gut health. This will help um, with regularity and prevent any constipation by getting in regular physical activity. And then most importantly, and I think often very overlooked, is eat enough food. Our culture is so inundated with dieting and restriction and cutting out certain foods, when in reality, if you want regular good digestion and good gut health, which good digestion is a key of you need to be eating enough. And if you don't eat enough, you cannot poop enough. So making sure you're eating enough food and eating the good variety. All foods play a role into our health. And you'll see each different food group here plays a role into the brain. So carbohydrates 
break down to glucose, and glucose is the main fuel source for the brain. We build neurotransmitters with protein-rich foods, um, and fat-rich foods support the structure and function of the brain, especially omega-3 fatty acids, and fruits and vegetables decrease inflammation. So every single food you eat breaks down into some ratio of glucose, amino acids, and lipids, everything. And all of those help nourish the body. So keeping those things in mind. And lastly, I think a couple really important parts um, in our conversation. As I said in the beginning, I specialize in disordered eating and eating disorders. And I think it's really challenging sometimes to put so much pressure on food and thinking, if I just eat the perfect way, I'll be healthy. If I eat the perfect foods, I'll cure my anxiety or I'll cure my disease. And food is the answer to everything. It is helpful and it is important, but it is one of many factors that influence our health. Our individual behaviors, which include how we eat, how we exercise, how we sleep, all of these things that we have control over, only account for about 30% of our total health. Other things that influence our health are our genetics, our access to healthcare, the environment, and our social circumstances. So health is often out of our control. And doing the things you can, I think, is super great. But if that puts too much pressure on you and thinking that I need to do everything perfect, I need to eat the perfect way, remind yourself that there are other factors that are going to play into account here. If you do have a mental health condition, please be kind with yourself. Food alone will not and cannot be the answer. I know this month is Mental Health Awareness Month. So if you are struggling, sure, like, please take some of these things and see if they help you but also recognize that there is no shame in therapy or support or medication to help with any situations and any kind of diagnoses. Within the disordered eating space a little bit more, um, a point I talk about a lot is that stressing and worrying about eating a specific food is likely to be more stressful than the food itself. So basically what this means is that I work with a lot of people that feel anxious or worried or guilty or ashamed if they eat a certain food that diet culture has labeled as bad or unhealthy. And there's so much stress going into that eating experience that they're going to give themselves a stomach ache and they're going to make themselves feel sick with eating that food. Realistically, that food and that, or that stress that's happening is so much worse for the body than the food itself. All food provides nourishment. And most importantly, trying to enjoy what you eat. A positive mental attitude can 100% influence how the gut reacts. So going in with a peaceful mindset to your eating, going in with a positive affect can help you feel and digest so much better. That vagal nerve is sending those good signals down to your gut for this to be a good time. So that is all I have. Thank you all so much for tuning in and listening. I do have um, resources here kind of... Um, and references, but I'll leave my information here. If anybody has um, questions, they can email me. Um, my cell phone number is my work phone right here, but you can always reach out. And now I'll pass it over to Maddie if there's any questions. Yes, great job, Kristen. I'm just gonna stop recording. Um...